Yeah, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, just, just two great talks, as usual, as expected. Um, it's interesting at the BATS at the moment, the British Association of Endocrine and Thyroid Surgeons annual meeting, for those of you who don't, don't know it, um, there's a lot of discussion about the Montgomery ruling and consent in thyroid surgery. And it's sort of split. People, people are now saying more and more you should consent every patient who's having a thyroidectomy for the risk of tracheostomy. <clears throat> I have a problem with that. Because, you know, a 30-year-old woman who has no option, who has a total thyroidectomy for Graves' disease, is going to be terrified when they're told about that. OK, you can think about it whichever way you want. But for bilateral parathyroid exploration, we never discussed it at all. Strange, isn't it? There are lots and lots of conundrums in thyroid and parathyroid surgery. And, you know, it, it, I always find it a bit depressing. You know, you come to meetings, particularly when our American colleagues come to speak to us, and you leave feeling guilty because you don't use interrupted parathyroid hormone level monitoring, nerve stimulation, continuous nerve monitoring, the gamma probe, blah, blah, blah. They seem to use these on every single case. Is that really true? I think what Omar said is important. You've actually got to look at your local practice, look at your local figures and design your practice in accordance with that. Anyway, prattle on. Right, so, so we're going to talk about goiters in the chest. And um, I tried to simplify things because I've got a fairly simple mind. I think there are three questions you need to ask. Because most of the time, you know, you get referred Mr. or Mrs. X, incidental finding from the respiratory, you know, physicians because they presented with COPD and they've got a lump in their chest. What are you going to do about it? I think you need to ask three questions. When... Do you need to remove or consider removing a thyroid goiter from the chest because it'll probably help the patient? When's it okay to leave it alone? And if you do need to remove it, do you need to open the chest? And it's, it's interesting, isn't it, the way you put things to patients. Patient comes to see you in clinic. Hello, Mrs. Smith. You've got a lump in your chest. It's nothing to worry about. It's not causing you any problems. It's not cancer. Okay? Hello, Mrs. Smith. You have a mass in your chest. Yes, it's a tumour, because a wart on your thumb is a tumour. It is compressing your windpipe, and we need to remove it. All right? Now, if you were Mrs. Smith B, you'd let the egotistical surgeon do whatever the hell he or she wanted to you, because you think it would be in your best interest. But is it? So what's the evidence? As with all of our surgical input, the evidence is poor. Systematic review of case studies. Great. There is some basic science work, particularly from Imperial, some mathematical modelling and stuff, which I'll touch on. And there are some guidelines and recommendations. As we've seen before, guidelines and recommendations, they are useful because they give you something to support your suggestion, your advice. But they're always made out by a self-selected group of individuals who know each other, who go to the same meetings, who eat dinner together, who do quite a lot of that area. And so they decide, we need to put some guidelines out. It's interesting, going back to what Sabal was saying, the uh, guidelines for parathyroid surgery in the asymptomatic patient, the, the cut-off of 50 is from one paper by Silverberg, and it's because, which is quite encouraging for me, that when you get to the age of 50, you're expected to live quite a few years beyond that still. And that's it. And that's why they use 50. Weird, isn't it? Anyway, so, of course, there are loads and loads of series of really but names we know all about, we've heard about so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so who get their trainee who needs a line on his or her CV to publish their series. And they're probably a little bit biased. So let's look at the physiology of the, the, the process of breathing. You breathe in. The thing that makes breathing harder is if the energy of breathing that you need to breathe increases. And that increases when frictional losses increase. The majority of frictional losses when you breathe in in a straight column of air, are lost at the glottis, because that's the narrowest part of your airway. And you can imagine a column of air slapping against your vocal cords, and it's just a bit harder to get through. But once you've got through, 
there's virtually no friction losses, about 5% in the rest of the trachea, in the normal trachea. Of course, what does a retrosternal goiter do to you? Well, it causes deviation, compression, or invasion. <clears throat> and so you can imagine any of those things will increase your work of breathing. <clears throat> and actually, some of the work from Imperial shows that tracheal deviation is just about as significant as quite impressive tracheal compression as far as increasing your work of breathing goes. So now we can say, brilliant, your trachea is over to the right, we need to take your left thyroid lobe out. That's a cogent argument. <clears throat> what about the asymptomatic goiter? This bloke called Pradeep in India did a very interesting study using um, uh, force vital capacity and body plethysmography to look at lung volume, lung fun function, etc. And he found that actually if you take the thyroids out of supposedly retrosternal goiters, out of supposedly asymptomatic patients, they actually, their respiratory function significantly improves. Okay. Flow volume loops. Again, Imperial have come up with the answer to this. I've, I've, I've never really got these flow volume loops. You know, you, if the patient is well motivated, they do a force expiratory volume and they get a nice little thing like that. If they're not so well motivated, it's not quite so good. And if there's a big goiter in the chest squeezing your windpipe, it's flattened even more. Well, they've shown that these are expensive. Again, as Omar touched on, they're positional. I, I really like that shoelace thing. I'm going to use that. That, that. That's the thing I really like about these meetings. You just always pick up something. And I think that's brilliant because that means something. This doesn't, but that means something. So, um, so basically, they suggest that flow volume loops are a waste of time unless you've got a patient with respiratory problems who has a retrosternal goiter and they also have other respiratory disease, and you want to know if their small airway disease is significant, because what you don't want to do, obviously, is do a fairly big operation on them and for them to feel no better. So that will enable you, to some extent, to tease out lower airway disease as being significant or not when considering retrosternal thyroidectomy. So uh, another of our friends gets involved in this one. 2009, there was a written debate between the Newcastle group Tom Leonard, Richard Bliss, etc., and the Sheffield group about whether you should be removing retrosternal goiters or not. And the Newcastle group quite strongly argued, well, you don't know their malignancy risk. Okay, you don't know. You might be leaving a cancer in the chest and unrecognised symptoms, citing Pradeep's paper. The Sheffield group, I think, played a blinder, which I'm quite pleased about because it would be a bit embarrassing if it happened in the Newcastle group, because they said, well, actually, you know, you can look at all the data the side effects are much higher if you're doing retrosternal thyroid surgery. And by and large, these patients are older as well. And the bottom one, they sold it to me. I love that. You know, 25% of over 70s in iodine deficient areas have retrosternal goiters. Should we be removing them all? Of course not. So there's a very strong argument for leaving these lesions alone. What we don't want is to deal with this. Now, that is impressive. So this surgeon has published this case report. A giant euthyroid endemic multinodal goiter with no structure compressive symptoms, 4.7 kilograms removed. Wow, hats off to you, mate. At least he had the decency to write this in his paper. Although the operation performed fluidly successfully, death occurred for essentially the same reasons as her disease. How much benefit has that patient derived? Not a great deal. So we've got to be very careful when we consider operating on these patients. Here we have some guidelines, and actually, <clears throat> these guidelines are based on one paper, a moderate, moderate quality, but actually they do give us something to stand next to, and I quite like that, because <clears throat> it's quite simple. You get a CT scan, and if your 2D image shows compression of the trachea by a third or more, you can expect this patient to gain from surgery respiratorially. Rather sort of ambiguously, they also go on thyroid gland weight of greater than 100 grams and you'll, you'll gain. I mean, how do you know that before you've done the operation? But anyway, I quite like the 35% thing. So <clears throat> what about doing nothing? So, so Joe Bloggs with the big retrosternal goiter sent to your clinic, please see and sort by your respiratory colleagues. And you say, 
you don't have to have anything done. But everyone in the back of their mind says, oh God, I'm a bit worried. I'm going to discharge this fella and he's going to have an acute bleed into his retrosomal goitre and he's going to turn up dead or an extremist and I'm going to get sued. How likely, how likely is that? Do you have to follow them up? Well, what's the point in following them up? I remember a professor of head and neck surgery used to say all these laryngectomy follow-ups, they need a chest x-ray annually. What the hell? You know, you know, you get your metastasis month one after your chest x-ray and you're screwed because your next one's in 11 months. It's, it's just a waste of time. It doesn't make any sense. So if you see one of these and you decide to leave them well alone, what do you do? CT scan them again in a year? Why? Just leave them. This guy called Sue looked at the data in Singapore. He looked at 15 years of acute presentations to ICU with acute respiratory embarrassment due to intrathoracic tumour. <clears throat> Only one of these was an acute retrosternal goiter with a bleed, and that patient made a full recovery post-admission after having that thyroid removed. Now, that tells me that the likelihood of an acute presentation due to a thyroid bleed, although everyone has seen it, very occasionally, but it's very, very rare. It's far rarer than the fact that your 65, 70-year-old patient may well die of something else in the interim. So I think it's perfectly reasonable in the asymptomatic patient to do nothing. Look at the American data. If you do a retrosternal thyroidectomy, you have a 73% increase odds of death during admission. So you have to be very careful who you select for surgery. So here's a European paper, again, written by one of our colleagues. Now, this is very interesting. They're going on about retrosternal goiter. <clears throat> Nothing I found fascinating when you read literature about retrosternal goiter. And they go on about when you need the chest opening or not. And I love this comment. The first one, I don't know if this shows up out there somewhere. It says, here, here, here. When is stenotomy inevitable? Okay. And the guy who writes the paper says, one requires stenotomy due to iceberg shapes goiter. What does that mean? When does a goiter become an iceberg? Okay. I'll touch on that a little bit more in a minute. The other paper looks at 35 patients. It's multi-centered, so you don't know who the surgeons are. You don't know what their experience is. 35 patients, extension of the carina on at least one view, fine. Four asymptomatic, 13 had chest opened, median stenotomy required in 12, thoracotomy in one. So why was, it, why was it required? What I would like to see are very experienced thyroid surgeons publishing these when the next line I like when they've actually taken the patient to theatre and they have attempted to deliver the thyroid through the neck and failed and then gone to stenotomy. And this happened in three. Given their due, it happened in three. But the other ones, it was a decision. You have a tumour in your chest. We need to open your chest to remove it. And that concerns me because that isn't evidence for the need to open the chest. And then a further concern, two deaths. Both of these had their chest opened. One was 83 and had a thoracic approach and developed a sternal dehiscence, which I will also touch on in a minute. So when does the chest need opening then? It does, in some cases. So would you describe that as an iceberg thyroid? It's sort of bigger down here than it is up here, so possibly. I don't know what it's made of, but, uh, but uh, that came out through the neck. What about this one? a big lump there. That's the thyroid. There is thyroid in the neck. That's important. That came out through the neck. Okay. I'm concerned that those patients would have had their chest opened. So what about this one? This is a post, I like these, this is a posterior mediastinal goiter. Would you say that's an iceberg goiter? Possibly. Well, that came out through the neck. These are interesting because <clears throat> you need to be aware that in those, quite often the recurrent laryngeal nerve is in front, there it is, in front rather than behind the goiter. So when you're actually delivering them, you need to feel for, all you, you can't see it, you've got to feel for this sort of strand that doesn't want to give way. That's the nerve. 
All right, you may well need a praxin, but just be aware of that. So what about these? Yes, you do need to open the chest sometimes. This is a primary intrathoracic goiter. It was never in the neck. Of course, it's, you've got to, if, if you need to remove it, that's the question. Do I need to operate on this patient? This was a 37-year-old woman with some respiratory embarrassment. I think she needed an operation. I might be wrong. I have certainly left primary intrathoracic goiter, but this one needed the chest open. And I, I, think, I, I don't think you can't get it out any other way. So if you're going to do the operation, so primary intrathoracic goiter, you have to open the chest. What about this? This is just, just going into the chest, but they've got tracheal invasion. That ain't going to come out with good, safe visibility through the neck because it's left the thyroid. It's gone into trachea. You'll need to open the chest to remove that lesion. This one, I, I keep showing this one because I got caught out. So, so these boys will have seen it and they'll be bored brainless by it. But this one looks like your normal scabbarded trachea, retrosternal goiter. But actually, if you look at 11 o'clock, there's a, slight, there's a slight flaw in the tracheal wall there. And actually, they had tracheal invasion. So always look at your own CT scans. What I would say to you is, if you're thinking about retrosternal surgery, opening the chest, how old is the patient you're thinking about doing this to? Do they have other com comorbidities? Are you aware of the risks of stenotomy? And are you giving the patient an informed choice? Going back to what I said in the first instance, you can always sell an operation to a patient, but are you being fair? That's how much higher your risk of respiratory complications are. And deep sternal wound infection rates, 1% to 5%. 50% mortality with a sternal dehiscence. That's what one of those two cases died of in the European paper. So I think that most retrosternal goiters you can leave alone. But Stang's paper, the ATA guidelines, I think that's quite a nice thing to stand by. Look for a third. So if you're having a conversation with a patient, you may be 70, you say, look, do you get around your normal life okay? Well, I'm short of breath. Okay, in the absence of small airway disease, looking at your goiter, yeah, your breathing will improve if we remove it. It may not improve enough for you, but it will improve to some extent, which I cannot quantify. Always remove the goiter through the neck. Unless it's intrathoracic, there's evidence of malignancy that's left. Or you have to consider stenotomy if it's a revision case because the blood supply can be different. Otherwise, it always comes from the neck. But if it's a revision case or intrathoracic, it doesn't necessarily. That's what I would tell a patient. I, don't, I have cardiothoracics on site, but I never tell them I'm doing a retrosternal goiter. They send them all to me. But... I would do that because the majority of these patients are elderly. I haven't yet failed to take one of these out through the neck. But if I did, I wouldn't open their or get someone to open their chest. I would wake them up and say, look, a bit like revision parathyroid surgery, what's the first question you ask once you've confirmed, that, reconfirmed the diagnosis? You say, look, we had a go. We did it for these reasons. Would you like us to do it again? Have a second go? And some patients will say no. Wake these patients up and say, look, we didn't manage to get it out through your neck. We can get it out by opening your chest. Would you like to consider that? Don't stress them out unnecessarily. Anyway, that's all I've got to say about retrosternal goiter.